Guys and girls, how are we? Mudzi from Muay Thai Interviews back here once again. And uh, my next guest, he hails all the way from Canada. He's been doing music since he was 12 years old. He's an MC songwriter who started Muay Thai back in 2009. And soon after starting Muay Thai, started to blend his two passions together to make walkout music for fighters such as Andy Housden, Liam Harrison, Arthur Saucer, Toby Smith, John Wayne Parr, just to name a few. As well, he's also provided theme music for the Bad Company Gym in the UK and Perth's very own The Fight Vault. He now goes by the stage name Ragnar Vallon and he has labelled his style as fight music. I'm joined by Andrew Martin. How are you, buddy? I'm good, Mudzi. How you doing, brother? Good, man. So you just woke up all the way over in Canada? Yeah, man. Just waking up. It's only... It's early in the morning there, later at night where you're at, so it's a bit of a difference, but, you know. That's all right, man. It's good that we could uh, both find the time to have a chat that suits both of us, so I'm happy. Absolutely, absolutely. It's great to great to have her to be on, and, you know, for you having me out, I appreciate it. No, mate, thanks for thanks for reaching out to me, man. Fucking was stoked when you when you um sent me a message, and I'm um, loving, uh, loving what you're doing at the moment, so thank you for your contribution. Thanks, man. I appreciate that infinitely. <laughs> so, dude, um, when you first out, started out in music, was emceeing what you knew you wanted to do, or did you start by like learning an instrument and emceeing was just like a gradual transition? Uh, it was pretty much emceeing from jump. Um, like I said, I was 12. I'm 34 now, so I mean, 1996 when I started rapping. Um, definitely from an age when it wasn't cool to rap and wasn't a thing, especially being a white rapper. Um, I played like the violin in my music class, but it wasn't my thing. There wasn't a, a lot of passion behind it. I actually just thought my music teacher was really hot. Um, <laughs> yeah, we all, 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 all the, all the kids did, you know. So uh, when it came to hip hop and MCing, like you said, it wasn't a cool thing. So when I when I started doing it, I actually my friend in class gave me the cassette tape for Cypress Hill Black Sunday and told me to listen to it. So I went and I was listening to it, and I kind of like realized when I was listening to this. I mean, at this point, my own my my only real exposure to hip hop was or rap would have been very bubblegum shit like fucking MC Hammer and Chris yeah. Croft, <laughs> that whatever. Um, and I just kind of realized there was like poetry over a beat, and I mean I wrote poetry at this time. Um, I've always been pretty artistic when it came to the words and 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 literature. So I just started s saying some of my poetry over like we didn't have beats back then. I couldn't just go on the internet, you know. Nobody I knew had turntables or records or anything. So I just like rapped right over the song. Yeah. And I got made fun of a lot because I, I really enjoyed it. It just kind of happened. There was no push there was no peer pressure I wasn't trying to impress other people who were doing it I just kind of just did it because it, it vibed with me and that energy was there so I went through a lot of shit doing that I got made fun of a lot because like I said people weren't doing it um, and it was a weird change because it was like until I was about 15 years old everybody told me I was trying to be black and I got made fun of that way and then Eminem came out circa about 1999 late 1999 and all of a sudden I was trying to be white yeah. And everybody grabbed, and and it, it became a whole other other machine. So, I come from the era of the people who, w when you rapped, you had to really want to do it because it wasn't the fucking cool thing to do in 1996, 1997. Yeah. Fast forward ten years, everybody in the damn mother raps now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you said Cypress Hill too, man, because I love them. Be real has got one of the most unique voices you'll ever hear. Absolutely, we were just. Uh, I was out with my daughter for Father's Day yesterday. And as soon as the kids fell asleep in the back, me and my buddy put on Cypress Hill Greatest Hits, and we were, you know, bumping boom, bitty, bye, bye, and <laughs> all the old school jams, man. But uh, yeah, I came up. I came. I definitely came up before it was a cool thing to do. Um, so I pride myself in that. I, I pride myself in having done it when it wasn't a trending thing to do. There was no internet, no social media, and I got beat up. I got beat up. I got made fun of. Um, you know, I had a lot of problems because of it. Yeah. And I was like, but I just wanted to do it. So there was really no transition. I just started doing it. I don't know why. I have no real reason. You know, there wasn't some motivating factor that got me to start rapping specifically. I just started fucking doing it. Yeah. Definitely. 1996. Definitely. And, and 
like just I'll get on to the next question, but another thing I loved about Cypress Hill is they mix rap with like metal. Uh, especially yep. like one of my favorite albums is um, Skull and Bones. Yeah, yeah. And they've got you know the first CD is rap with you know hip hop beats, and then the second CD is metal with them rapping over the top of it. So it shows, yeah, yeah. So, so it shows that you can combine the two the two styles together to make one style. Yeah, which which is essentially my shit right there, right? Like heavy rock, classic rock, metal, and then classic East Coast style hip hop. Yeah, which is so I mean. That's why I don't want to give anything away. But when I heard one of your tunes, um, I instantly thought of that. Word, man. I don't want to Word. Give I try. I definitely try to give, make music, and present a style that was very true to me from jump. Um, you know, we can maybe get into it a bit later if we, we get into that discussion. But um, I, I, I didn't want to stray from my roots. Yeah. Even when music started changing a lot and, and the sound and what was popular. I, I came up in, this, in a time when Wu-Tang and Biggie and Nod and Mob Deep were famous and on TV. And those were the music videos that were being played. Those were the, the big tunes. Um, and it, music started changing. And I didn't, want to, I didn't want to change with it. I wanted to make music I, I, I enjoyed making. Because yeah. I, I tried to look at every song like, if this wasn't me on the song, if this was somebody else sounding the same, doing the same thing, would I listen to it? And... I tried to stay true to that, which, you know, in later on in the years might have been a bit detrimental to my, my career because I didn't want to take that curve and, and start changing my sound to, to be more marketable. Yeah. But artistic integrity was, was everything to me for a long time. So, and I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot of fighters who, who can relate to that, you know, who didn't want to sell their souls, you know, it's, uh, we'll get, we can get into the similarities between the fight <laughs> and rap a bit later I think <laughs> too easy mate too easy and you started training Muay Thai around 2009 how did you actually come across Muay Thai and did you ever have any fights yourself yeah yeah I have uh, 12 fights um, so when I, I was like every other kid right I mean I came up in that era where Van Damme was the shit <laughs> um, like like so many, I mean, even like John Wayne Parr and like a lot of my mentors and my coaches and crews along along the way, all grew up watching blood sport and yeah. kickboxer. So that was essentially my first kickboxer was my first exposure to it when I was really young, and and I always really wanted to do it. Um, but I wasn't a very nice kid growing up. I made a lot of mistakes. I spent a lot of time, let's say, as a guest at some of our Canada's greater resorts. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. I was locked up a lot for being a being a shitty human being. Um, we don't need to get into all that. But I mean, when I was a kid, I was I was a dumb kid. So my parents wouldn't put me in any of that. They wouldn't give me. They wouldn't put me in any martial arts because it was very much. I, I definitely would have used it and let it go to my head, and it would have been a, a bad experience. It definitely would have been a negative experience in my life. So um, I came up wanting to be fucking Jean-Claude Van Damme. I wanted to be kickboxer. I wanted Muay Thai and be Nox and Cow. Yeah. You know, um, and when I ended up actually getting into it, I was at this point in my life, it was about late 2009, and I was talking actively about wanting to, to start kickboxing, or Muay Thai, or, or just something. I wanted to do something different. I needed to test different limits. And my friend said, oh, this guy I'm working with, He's training at this gym and they're having fights this weekend and he wants us to come watch. And so at this time, musically, I was working with a lot of like the army of the pharaohs, like Apathy, it's self-titled. I don't know how many of the listeners might be familiar with them, but in the underground, they're, they're pretty well-known guys from America. Um, and when I went into this gym to watch the fights, they're just in-house smokers. And in between the fights, they were playing Wu-Tang, army of the pharaohs. Yeah. Immortal technique, like, and I, I was just like, "Are you fucking serious?" So one minute I got two guys trying to smash each other's face in, and then as soon as the bell goes, boom, Wu Tang's playing and yeah. fucking jet mind tricks, and I just that was it. I, I signed up right there. I said I'll be back tomorrow morning to to register and pay, and I showed up first thing in the morning, and that was it. I was I was a two a day guy from jump. I was like morning class, night class. I stayed extra. I just I, I went balls to the wall with it. And that's, it just happened. As soon as I saw it with my own eyes, I was like, I have to do this. I have to. And just I started up, I started the next day. Instantly hooked, eh? Instantly. 
instantly. Nice one, dude. Nice one. Um, now I'm gonna um jump a little bit forward here, but prior oh. prior to changing um your stage name to what it is now, you used to go by the name Wordsmith, but everyone used to yeah. call you Words in everyday yeah. life ever since you were young. Um, and you told me that that bothered you a little bit as if by calling you that, that's all you had to offer um, as your musical talent. Is that one reason why you decided to change the name? Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons. Um, it, it started off as Wordsmith. Um, and then about two, about 2009, probably about when I, when I started Muay Thai, maybe a little bit after, um, there's other Wordsmiths. There's a Wordsmith from the States from Baltimore, there's a wordsmith from the United Kingdom, um, both of which were doing their own things in their respective countries, and we were all kind of beefing with each other. I was doing my thing in Canada, and I was well known in Canada, and they, you know, so I just said, fuck it. I didn't, these guys are, you know, one guy owns the name here, another guy owns the name here, and we're all, all this legal mumbo jumbo crap, and I'm like, like, dude, if you want to meet up and fight over the name, we can do it. Um, I didn't want to deal with any of that legal crap, so I, I was just like, hey, I'm going to short it to words. And it, people had already been calling me words as a short form for so long. It was pretty natural. But I had, it's like, like I said, I came up in a time when rapping was a little different. It, it really meant something. Uh, yeah. When people, and I'm really good at what I do. I mean, that's why I kept at it so long. I, I know how good I am at rapping. I'm, I'm, I know how great I am at, at emceeing. I know how, how phenomenal a songwriter, performer, and, and, a, and a recording artist I am. I'm good at a lot of things, but I'm great at this. Um... But back in those days, when you rap like that and you blow people's minds, it's a real novelty thing, and it really was. It was it, it, there wasn't pe a lot of people, especially where I was at and, and here in Canada, who rapped the way I rapped, that aggressive, lyrical, old school '90s punch you in the face style rap music. And so it, it became like this novelty, and words became this thing. And and before I knew it, you know, mid 2000s, 2004. Everybody was calling me words. Everywhere I went, my friends, parents, it was like, and I liked it at first because, you know, I'm getting all this, this, all these accolades, I'm getting all this attention, um, you know, and, and it's big for the ego. But as I started to get older, and it's like words all the time, everywhere I went, words, 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 I realized that words and Andrew had pretty much just become this one and the same. Yeah. There was there was really no division between myself as, as a man, as just a regular person, and, and the, the rap version of me and, and my stage name, my stage monitor and image and, and presentation. And that's a really fucked up thought when you, when I, you know, like I said, when I was younger, it didn't bother me so much. I mean, I didn't really think about it. I just thought it was cool. Everybody knows me. I'm, you know, I'm really popular. I can go lots of places in the world and people know who I am. I thought it was cute. You know, my friends, parents calling me words. And then as I got older and I realized, like, I don't even have a fucking identity. Like, my identity is literally this dope rapper who likes to fight. And that was it. <laughs> you know, there's so much more to me. And you start going places and, and you tell people, hey, call me Andrew. And it's like, they couldn't do it. Yeah. It's like they're incapable of calling me Andrew. Andrew doesn't exist to them. Who's this fucking Andrew guy you speak of? Um, and it, like I said, as I grew older and I became a little more in touch with myself, as a, as a man, as, as a human being, I started to realize that was a really negative thing because Words words wasn't a fucking nice guy. He's intelligent, he's great at rapping, but I was aggressive, I'm alpha male, I like to fight, I'm a very in your face. And that was great for the music, yeah. but when I realized that that was literally just who I was 24-7, I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like the fact that I wasn't able to shut myself off. And even if I tried at that point, to still refer to myself as words and try and change that dynamic and that perception and that relationship people have with me wouldn't have ever worked. So it was like I needed to change everything, all of it. I wanted to start from where who I was as a, as a performer, you know, as a, as a personality was totally separate from, from who I was as, as, a, uh, as a person. So that's uh, it, it was a strange process. It didn't happen overnight. I just uh, I knew something needed to change and something needed to give, and I didn't want to be words anymore. I wanted to start fresh, but I really didn't know how. And when it did come about and it happened, 
it was very natural, but it, it didn't happen overnight. But it, it was definitely a natural transition once I knew where I wanted to go, once I had the name, and uh, and I'd kind of disconnected myself from a lot of people. It's very, it's hard to dis- disconnect yourself from like everybody when yeah. when you're on social media and you make music and everybody knows you. Um, so I just stepped back for like almost a year and just stayed off everything, and and uh, that's that's where the process began. And but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I needed to start fresh, clean slate, new name, new symbolism, um, new branding, new message. You know, all all new, and and it's it's been working. But it it was a process, and I was very nervous about it when when I first. Yeah, no no doubt, man, and. At the start, was it hard for people who knew you to get used to a different name after knowing you in words for so long? Absolutely. They still call me words all the time. I have to correct people constantly. (laughs) Um, And see, like, when it happened, so when I decided I wanted to change my name, it it went beyond just the words thing. It just went, I've been words for so long, and I've been so many different versions of myself over that period of time. For all the great things that I've done, there's also a lot of negativity, a lot of dumb shit that I've done, a lot of people I'd upset. Like I said, I was very in your face, very aggressive. So I wasn't like one of these gun talking, my boys will jump you. I was the guy who, like, someone shit talks me, it talks some nonsense. I'll show up at the show by myself and punch him out and walk in the bone. Because <laughs> I've never been on that gang shit. I've never been on that, yo, my guns and my, my glocks. And even when I was doing things that were similar to that kind of lifestyle, I didn't rap about it. Yeah. I really wanted I wanted to be known as as a lyrical presence. I wanted my talent to be heard. I didn't want any of that convoluted fake tough guy bravado with the guns. I was like, if you're a tough guy, we can fight. Um, and when I realized that that's kind of like how everybody viewed me, and I had created as many enemies, maybe even more enemies as I had friends or supporters. Um, it was my fault, and it's really hard to break away from that. I mean, because we all grow. I mean, I'm 34 now. I mean, I came up in this crazy industry and watched the music industry change like five times over, and uh, it was really crazy to realize that there's a lot of damage I couldn't undo. Um, mm. The name words. There's people who just I know wouldn't listen to my music or would immediately start talking smack because they heard from someone or this or that, and and through social media, it, it was really hard to escape yeah. past first impressions or, or, or biases based on things they've heard or whatever. And I was like, I was done with it all. I wanted to just start it all over again because at the end of the day, a lot of people are going to want to look at you in the, the perspective that best suits their narrative. So if I'm doing great now, but they want to remember me and still be able to talk shit about me. They're never going to see me for me now. They're always going to remember me from when I was 25. Yeah. Um, so long as that name, Words, was out there, Wordsmith, and that that image and that presentation, I was like, there's, I'm never going to, going to be able to break free as long as I'm using that name and I'm continuing to, um, to push that agenda. So I just changed it all. And there's like, like you said, man, there's... It's been working, and people that I know had issues with me as words, or there was some type of attention, or, or whatever it was, yeah. have been getting back in contact with me and telling me how proud of me they are and how how amazed they are, and and this and that, which is hilarious to me because <laughs> a year ago they were saying very different things. Yeah. Um, but it it just goes to show that you know it doesn't take much to. You know, if you put in the effort, you can change things. People are very, people are a lot more easily influenced than, than you'd like to think. Um, but once people see you one way, you got, you you can't change that. So it was like, all, as soon as I changed the name and I started doing music differently, and I took a very very different approach to how I was presenting myself, yeah. all of a sudden, it's like all that shit didn't matter anymore. You know, and then people see the the fight music, they see these walkout songs for these fighters. And I swear, people think I'm like getting rich off of this or something, which is very much the opposite. Um, completely. But people see dollar signs. They think, yeah. oh, here, you know, he's going at it again. Now he's doing these walkout songs for these big fighters. And 
now people want to reattach themselves to me because what if I'm famous next year? If I'm yeah. famous next year, they want to be able to say they're my friend. Yeah. You know, so it's uh it, it's an interesting it's it's an interesting s- s- turn of events when you see people almost how opportunistic people can be when they they think you're going to make money, you know? So um as words there was points where I was very public with sponsors, labels, um, things that have fucked me around. And so it gave people the opportunity to look at me in a negative light and say, oh, he's failing. Oh, he fucked up. He did this. Ah, see, I knew he wouldn't make it. I knew he, he couldn't pull the trigger, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then once people see something, that might be dollar signs again. My fucking inbox is full. Full of people who a year ago were saying I ain't shit and I'm, I'm a failure and whatever, whatever, whatever. It's like they come, they come 360. Oh, without a, without a doubt. They, they do 180s really quick. Um, when, I, when I first really started to make moves with the fight music things, it happened even when I was words. It happened back when I was words before all the things that are happening now. Um, and I, I, like, I kind of blended it into my music and just started making music that was aggressive but talking about martial arts. And I, like I said, I was all about the one-on-one fight and stuff. And uh, when I started making that music and I got some sponsors and I was getting some attention from companies that were working with big UFC fighters. So people saw me attached to them and they're attached to these big name UFC fighters. And so therefore, immediately, people think I'm about to get rich, I'm going to be big, I'm going to do all this and, and you know, I'm going to be in the octagon doing per- performances at UFC events and stuff. And then when that went to shit, then everyone's like, aha, we knew it, you know, or, 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 you couldn't do it. The yeah. fight music thing will never work, you know, because I refuse to make radio music. Um, I refused to change my style and make music that I didn't like. And when people saw that my attempt at, at remaining true to myself well, didn't work and it, it failed, quote, quotations failed in their eyes, and then they could go back to talking shit. Oh, see, there he is just trying to be this – this tough guy, 90s style rapper, and see it doesn't work. Um, and I let people simmer on that for a couple years. Cool. Think whatever the fuck you want. I didn't even know what I was going to do. Yeah. But now that I'm back and the name's changed and all these walkouts for these big fighters are coming, it's almost like people never said shit. And they're yeah. all my best friend again. They're my best friends. I knew you'd make it. I knew you could do it. I'm like, I literally am looking at a message right now of you telling me I ain't shit from... 14 months ago. Um, so it, it's been very interesting um, to watch this shift because I, I was words. I never did a name change. It was just words, wordsmith my whole career. So to do this and just watch the human nature of things, it's, it's fucking interesting, man. So I'm laughing at it. Like, I had dudes when I was – and I was, remember I said when I was younger and I got made fun of a lot and yeah. I, because no one rapped. It wasn't a thing. So there's literally guys who made fun of me and because I said when I was 14, 15 years old, I'm like, I'm going to rap. I'm going to be considered one of the best. I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to put out albums and I'm going to be fucking dope. And I'd get made fun of and it was, yeah, okay, MC Hammer, okay, fucking Vanilla Ice, Eminem, whatever, whatever. And I got made fun of. I got beat up. You know, I got picked on. I wasn't a big fucking strapping fighter looking dude when I was 14. I was a little skinny noodle kid wearing 5XL hoodies and shit. <laughs> so, and then when I started making music and I moved away and I was traveling around and people from back home from when I was a teenager actually started to like gain win, especially when social media and, and the internet became a lot bigger, let's say circa 2005, 6, 7. And all these people who used to beat me up and pick on me and make fun of me and make my life hell are sending me messages going, oh, man, I heard your new song. I knew you'd make it, man. I always knew you. <laughs> you literally used to bloody my nose like every week telling me I'm a, I'm a uh, whatever, whatever. And, you know, 10 years later they see me doing it and they're like, I knew you'd make it, bro. I always supported you, man. <laughs> it's interesting, man. It's interesting. And, yeah. uh um, so yeah, I don't know, man. I kind of rambled off on some on some shit there, but <laughs> all good, mate. All good. Um, and like, no doubt, um, being in the music industry, um, we sort of touched on it, but you would have met some really cool people and some absolute snakes. 
Um, away from all the, the glitz and glamour of it all, what are some shady tricks and things that people have tried to do to you in the music industry? <sighs> Fuck. How much time you got, man? <laughs> how, much, how much time you got, Mazi? How much right. do you like, my friend? Let's see, let's see, let's see. All right. The one that probably affected me the most was I grew up listening to really underground hip hop, even like back when in high school. And there was this one group called Brooklyn Academy that I was really into in like grade 11. They had songs, I'm stupid, I'm trooping through Brooklyn. What the fuck you looking at? I'm stupid. And it was like my anthem. And one of the guys in that group, his name is Block McLeod. So about 2008, 2000, maybe early 2009, I, uh, I hit him up. This is when MySpace was going. This is MySpace days. Yeah. So I, I hit him up via MySpace and I said, look, man, you know, I was working with this guy Rhymes at the time. Me and him don't, don't talk anymore, but I was working with this guy Rhymes and we were work together. We were, we were words and rhymes. And uh, I'm, I, I hit this Block McLeod guy up, really not expecting much, and said, hey, man, like I got this album. I got Apathy on it, self-titled on it, Reef the Lost Cause on it. We got all, all these guys who, are, who are, are down with your circle, and we don't have anybody to put out. So he listened to it, and he was like, oh, this is so dope, and whatever. He's like, I want to sign you guys to my label, which was called Disturbia Music Group. And so this is my first label. Like real label that there was like interested that, that existed and I knew that there was some some solid people on the label and so of course that's the dream right and when you're coming up and you've been doing it for so long you will be willing to overlook the signs that you're about to get fucked in the ass yeah because you want to be able to say I I'm signed fuck all the not fuck the, the the problems and the complications it might be fuck my gut instinct telling me that this is not the right thing to do. Um, I went with it anyway because I wanted to be able to say I was signed. I wanted to be able to say I signed a record deal. Um, I literally watched the owner of this label just be a drugged out, alcoholic piece of shit. Like, I don't even need to get in all the stories specifically, but the guy was just a piece of shit, shoving shit up his nose, just a drunk, arrogant, fuck face yeah but i didn't care i wanted to, we wanted the label we wanted to say we signed a, a record deal whoa whatever we ignored it so me and rhyme set up a tour to go to europe the beginning of 2010 and block mcleod had said oh i'm gonna i'm gonna set you up with this and with this and with this uh when you go out there and you guys just got to get out there and i have everything set up for you so we're like okay so we went and we put together the, the flight money. We went together, we put, a, put together a few grand for some spending money. And then we were supposed to have um, all these shows booked with the Snow Goons and, and a whole bunch of, of pretty famous underground guys. And we got to Europe and he had somebody, one of his people meet us in Switzerland. And they took us back to this little, little village. And these guys were very, these Swiss guys were great. They like loved our music. They treated us like superstars. It was fucking amazing. And then there was a thousand copies of our album waiting for us there. A thousand. What the fuck we were supposed to do with a thousand CDs in fucking Switzerland? I have no idea. But we showed up at this guy's house, and he's like, "Here you go." And there was two boxes, big ass boxes, full of our albums, a thousand copies. So I hit up. Block McLeod, and I say, oh, hey, man, that's, yo, the album looks so dope. Oh, my God, this is so sick. And he's like, all right, let me know when you can send me that $3,000. And I'm like, what $3,000? He's like, what, you think that shit's free? And I'm like, yeah, I absolutely do. That's why we signed with you, was so you could take care of our expenses. He's like, tries giving me this this runner, like this, this nonsense story about how that's not how the industry works, and all artists pay for their own cop. And... and I, I guess I failed to mention, we hadn't discussed that these albums would be there. So we didn't know these albums were coming. We just showed up and they were there waiting for us. Yeah. Um, and so this guy's giving me this fucking hoorah story about how that's how the industry works and we need to give him $3,000. And I'm like, bro, I'm not giving you a fucking cent. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, oh, you fucking piece of shit. You're off the tour then. Fuck you, rah, 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 and all this 
whatever, man. Probably fucking coked out of his mind or something. But he sent some pretty nasty emails that pretty much solidified that we were no longer partners in yeah. any business sense. He threatened me physically. He told me we were off these two off these tours that we were supposed to be on, and we were fend for ourselves. So that's what I did. I called up everybody I knew in Europe, and I booked my own tour for us. And we just went and did a uh, an impromptu tour, and we took as many copies of the CD as we could carry with us. I think we we walked away with like 300 copies, and with our suitcases and our bags that we already had shit in, we were walking around with a lot of shit around Europe. Um, so I told him to go fuck himself. And we did our own thing. So we got back to Canada. And the Snow Goons ended up touring Canada the next October. So, I don't know, six months later or something. Yeah. And we ended up getting booked on a bunch of those shows because we knew one of the artists on the on the lineup. And we got there and we met these Snow Goons guys and we told them the story. And they're like, yo, that guy never talked to us about any show. So we weren't actually booked on any shows he was talking about. So that whole tour he took away from us didn't even exist. He was just trying to extort us for $3,000, thinking, oh, they're in Europe. What are they going to do? If they don't give me the money, they're fucked and they don't have anything. And I guess he underestimated my sense of principle because I yeah, just told him to go fuck himself. And, and that was it. So we, we pretty much got stuck in Europe. We had to leave behind like 700 copies of our own album, like just left them, couldn't take them, see ya. Jesus. And, and yeah, and, and ended up having to bop our way around Europe. If it hadn't been for me having a, 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 a smaller but faithful support group and network in Europe, um, Germany, France, Switzerland, Holland, um, we, we would have been in a, in a bit more trouble. But we ended up having a great time. Um, I didn't really hear much from that gentleman ever again. I met some other people that he tried to pull similar things with, but that that was probably the worst, man. I was really there was a moment there where we're stuck in Switzerland and we think we're going on this tour and we we put our faith in this in the head of this label that he had our our everything taken care of, and all of a sudden, bam, no tour, no nothing. We're fending for ourselves. Um, luckily, it worked out and we had a great time, but could have gone the other way and. Yeah, trying to extort some young kids out of three thousand bucks is was a pretty shitty experience to go through. No doubt, man, unbelievable. Um, yeah, Jesus. Um, that's pretty gnarly, actually. <laughs> and at one point, um, around two thousand and twelve, um, Justin Bieber and his father were looking to sign you <laughs> to their label, but um, that didn't work out too well. Can you? Um, what happened there? All right. Um, so I can actually remember the date just because it was my dad's my dad's birthday. It was April thirteenth, two thousand twelve, and I had a fight. And my mom, my dad, everybody came to watch me fight. And my gym that I fought for, they originated in Stratford, Ontario, Canada, which is where Justin Bieber is from. So I fought my fight. After my fight. My coach calls me over. He's like, Andrew, come over here. I want you to meet somebody. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? He's like, oh, this is Jeremy Bieber. And I'm like, Jeremy Bieber? Like, what, are you fucking Justin Bieber's dad? And I was just joking. And he's like, yeah, I am. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. So he starts telling me how much he enjoyed watching me fight. He's like, oh, you have a warrior's fucking, you're a, you're a, a headhunter. And, and I'm not like a great fighter or anything. Like, I can do some Muay Thai. I'm no in the in comparison to the guys I do walkout songs for, I suck and I'm terrible and I look like a bag of shit. But in the amateur world, I had some fun and I'm a scrapper by nature. So he said he liked my presence, my, my style, that I, he could tell I'm a fighter. And I was like, cool, cool, cool. I'm letting him talk his shit and I'm just waiting for my, my minute because I'm like, I just do Muay Thai for fun. I wasn't trying to be a pro fighter. So I'm like trying to just wait for my minute to kind of be like, listen, I only do this for fun. This is what I really do. So I finally found my moment. I said, hey, I actually make music. I, I'm an MC. Fighting, I just do it for fun. And he's like, oh, yeah? Are you any good? And I was like, well, it depends on your idea of good. If you think Lil Wayne and Rick Ross are, are really good, then you probably won't like me too much. But if you like Nas and Big Pun, then you'll probably think I'm amazing. So he's like, all right. So we exchanged numbers. He told me he was going away. Call him in a week, and we'd get together. So I, met, I called him a week later, of course. And we met up 
and he was driving around in Justin's. Justin has this like Cadillac that's just, like built in like looking like a Batmobile. It looks like the Batmobile kind of, that's they call it. And so he, he comes, we meet up, and he takes me out in this, and he bumps a whole bunch of our of our music, and he freaks out, like loses his mind. He's like, "This is some fucking so dope." He's like, "I'm going to see Justin tomorrow. I'm gonna take it with me. I want to play it for him. If he likes it, we're gonna make something happen." So he went, met up with Justin. Um, we spoke with Justin on the phone before he left. His dad's like, "I'm coming. You guys have you have to hear these these guys' music. I'm coming." Blah blah blah. And so we left. He came back and brought us a bunch of autographed Justin Bieber shit, like words and rhymes, <laughs> T-shirts autographed by Justin Bieber. I ended up giving them to like my friend's kids and shit and whatever. Kid cried. I gave a shirt to a 12-year-old girl who loved Justin Bieber. She like legitimately had a fucking meltdown in front of me and cried because <laughs> Justin had touched the shirt that I gave her. <laughs> Serious. So I mean, it went to a good cause. It went to a good place. But nonetheless. He uh, decides, he, he plays it for Justin, Justin loves it, they come up with some fucking idea between the two of them, and he comes back to Canada, says, I want to meet with you, and we want to sign you, we want to sign you guys, Justin's going to, me and Justin are going to own the label together, Justin's going to handle the biz, like, the network on, on the, the celebrity end, and the big producers, and all that shit, and Jeremy was going to run, you know, be the face, this was when Justin was putting out Carly Rae Jepsen, so, a very huge contrast in the sounds and images of, of us in comparison with that. So the dad was going to be the face of, of this while Justin ran everything in the background so he could continue his fluff pop image. Yeah. So we went on our second tour to Europe um, in May of 2012. Uh, Justin's dad is actually a, a part owner of the, the company, the, the fight apparel company Head Rush. So we immediately got sponsored by them. They gave us like three huge duffel bags of clothes, like probably $10,000 worth of gear. And they said, just take it to Europe with you, give it away, wear it, whatever you want to do. Um, so we're super excited. He says, we're going to be offering you a contract of upwards of a million dollars. And it was a real deal. Like, what do you guys, do you think you can perform in front of 40,000 people at a stadium? You're going to be touring with Justin. You're going to be his opening support. A lot of big willy talk. Um, and of course, we're very excited. This is, I had a, a daughter, I had family, I had life problems. So to me, that kind of money was about to change my whole life. Like, I, I didn't care about changing my sound. I'm like, yo, I'm broke. I have a kid I need to take care of and show me the money. You show me the money, I'll rap however the fuck you want me to, as long as you pay me for it first. Um, so we came back from Europe and we ended up going to a club in Toronto to celebrate and I guess Jeremy Bieber had some serious drug problems that, I mean, it's, it's public knowledge now, but I, I didn't know this at the time. Um, but he has some serious drug problems and, and some serious alcohol problems, and he's pretty much a piece of shit. So I guess he got drunk and high on whatever the fuck he was high on, and he saw me talking to somebody, and in his mind, I was trying to create a side deal and push him out of it. So I was trying to push the Bieber out of out of everything and create some side deal with some fighter guy. I don't even remember his fucking name. Um, and he came and sucker punched me in my face three times. I didn't see it. He just came up kind of behind, beside me. And one minute I was, I was talking to Rhymes, and the next minute I was on the ground. And literally an hour before, the guy was coming up behind me and grabbing my shoulders and putting his arm around me and telling everybody, this is my fucking golden boy right here. These are my golden boys. We're going to make a million dollars this year. You're ready to make a million dollars this year. So in this split second, I'm on the ground. I'm trying to process all this shit because I don't know who hit me. I see Jeremy Bieber standing like above me with this crazy look in his eye. But I'm like, did this motherfucker just hit me? There's no – how why would this motherfucker hit me? It doesn't even make sense. I, I, like, I, I couldn't process it. So I finally just stand up and I'm like, did you just fucking hit me, man? And his reply, I don't know what he meant by it, but his reply was, you stepped in the wrong hood, bro. <laughs> that was that was Jeremy Bieber's elegant reply. And then I just tuned him up. Like I was in, Jeremy Bieber used to be an MMA fighter, so I can't, he's not a pussy, but he's definitely not a fighter anymore. Like he's not an MMA fighter anymore. And 
years of drugs and alcohol, you know, Does took their you? toll on him. Yeah. But dude could throw down, and I ended up having to have a good go. And I, I was feeding it to him really good. I beat the shit out of him pretty proper. Um, bouncers caught what was going on. They ran over, and they tossed me out. And literally, that was the end of it right there. Um, a bunch of my guys from um, my gym, my coaches, and some of my some of the senior athletes were at one of the coaches' um, stagging does the week the week after in Stratford, and Jeremy Beaver was there, and his whole face. They said it was green and yellow, and his whole face. They're like, "Man, you fucked him up," but it cost but it cost me the record contract, um, which, in hindsight, I'm glad that I hadn't signed anything yet. Could you imagine that happening? And then them owning me still. Well, I was going to say, everything happens for a reason, my friend. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that story has been, that, that's the like the more professional version of the story. But like <laughs> when I am when I was drinking around campfires or drinking at, at, at get-togethers, and it became co- common knowledge that, you know, words punched out Justin Bieber's dad. And so I'd go places and people would want me to tell the story and, a lot of la- a lot of laughs have been had at that gentleman's expense, but that that was that was the closest I got to to the big, you know, making that big money. Um, the you know the the dream of being on TV and on all the radio stations and and magazine covers. And I'm really glad it didn't happen. I think it would have destroyed me as a human. I don't think I would. I think I would have become a much worse version of myself. Um, I was still an egomaniac at that point. I was still incredibly arrogant, borderline fucking narcissist with my my views of myself, my importance in music. And so I'm glad that shit didn't happen. I'm glad it forced me to check myself. Um, and in all honesty, I should have just got up and walked the fuck away. Uh, if he wanted to, he could have sued me, could have charged me. He's got the family money to do it. It could have gone yeah. a different way for me. So I'm really lucky that that didn't happen. But if I had got the money and I had got the fame, then fuck, man. Probably would have thrown Muay Thai to the wind and just gone off on a, on a very destructive downward spiral. I, I wasn't ready to, to take on that kind of money and fame and, and whatever. So you're right. It, it, shit does happen for a reason, man. And it's a funny fucking story. It's a funny ass fucking story. That is a hilarious story. <laughs> stepped in the wrong hood, bro. Like, what does that even mean? We're in like a swanky club in Toronto. He tells me he stepped in the wrong fucking hood. We're not in, like probably just just the booze and and uh, and all the other stuff. I reckon. Yeah, yeah, man. So so that was that. Like, I, I at one point I had him in a full clinch knee, and I had him up against a wall, and I I had him clinched up right up on the back of his head, and was just bomb feeding him the knee dance and that's when uh, that's when the bouncer came up behind me and they didn't beat me up or anything. they just grabbed me and threw me out of the street and they're like just get the fuck out of here man and I left that was probably and, a good uh, thing it could have yeah. been a lot worse for you it absolutely could have it absolutely um, could have and and after training Muay Thai for a bit and then having already forged a successful music career for yourself what was it that made you um, want to go in a different direction and blend the two arts together um, when I, when I blended them together originally, it wasn't how I did now. Um, like when I did it, I, I had the music career already and like I had that aggressive, very in your face style. So just blending, once I was into the Muay Thai, I just started doing it. Like I didn't really think about it, but I wasn't separating it from, I wasn't separating it from the music, it, it all just became one. So it was like I was still this very braggadocious, um, egotistical MC who had now was learning proper warrior methods and had done it was doing fights and I let it go to my head a little bit. I mean, I had the best intentions, but just fighting and, and my style of rap went together so easily. You know, it literally justified everything I said. So when I talked about punching someone in the face, now that I did martial arts, people know I actually do punch people in the face. And it just became, it just happened. But I wasn't doing it. I wasn't trying to market it. I didn't really know what I was doing. It it, it just kind of fed a little bit more into my fucking already uh, inflated ego. 
um, that I was now a more validated tough guy. So therefore, I could implement it into my music a little more. Um, so like, yeah, it, it ended up feeding my ego a bit. But if I hadn't have done that, and I hadn't have created that, that fight music sound, because like I said, I had sponsors like, the, the sponsor I told you about, uh, Head Rush, and then I, I also had Fear the Fighter, um, which they fucked me around for a lot of money. But they were a pretty big company at the time, and, and like they're sponsoring Michael Bisping, Cub Swanson, Frankie Edgar, um, a whole bunch of people. So it, it was a really legitimate company to be sponsored by, and it all happened. Those happened because of that that fight music sound. But I wasn't focusing on it. I was just rapping, same battle rap. I'll smash you. I'm the best. I'm the dopest. You can't fuck with me. Blah blah blah. That yeah. kind of stuff, and, and it's great. I do it really well, but there was no magic behind it. Um, so I had the right idea. I was just going about it the right, the wrong way, and wasn't in the right place spiritually and emotionally and mentally to to execute that idea uh, properly. So it it ended up fading away with words when I, I kind of just get tired of it all. Um, I got tired of the, the the rap. I got tired of the pursuit. I got I got tired of there being no magic in it anymore. When you do it that long, and and it's work, and it's your everyday hustle, and you deal with all this shit, and there's more sacrifice than gain. And there's more cons than pros, and the magic's going to get tired. And I quit. Like I fucking quit, man. I moved away to Hick fucking town. Took a job teaching Muay Thai in a in a. <laughs> one of like the most country city you could imagine big jacked up country boy truck driving jacked <laughs> up truck driving country boys with their cowboy hats and their steroid muscles and their oil rig money um, to just get away from it all and that's kind of where everything changed um, I really separated myself from it and I just went to teach in Muay Thai I was like I'm just going to take this passion out of my life and focus on this passion, and if this other passion over here, you know, the music, if it's meant to happen, something will happen on its own, and it will happen naturally. If it's meant to be, it will be. If it's not, you know, I had a great run, and so I just focused on teaching and instructing, and focused on training some fighters, and and then things just happened, and that's an, that's a, a whole other story. So I don't know if you want me to roll into it, but it's uh, it's a strange story how how it came about. It just, it just happened, and uh, I wasn't sure how it would even go. I, I really took a big chance. Uh, um, yeah, because I'm, I'm interested to hear. Like, you talk about how you were terrified to try something new, um, as in your fight music. Um, what specifically was it that made you doubt what you were attempting to do? Being somebody else. Um, like, cause when I did the fight, like I said, when I, when I did the fight music as words. And it was just part of my already existing character, my already existing image, and I just kind of blended the, the fight element into it. Um, but I was still words, and it, and it was still that same, like I said, that years and years and years and years of, of, of image building, bridges, bridges burning, all types of stuff. So, But my name, words, was symbolic with dope emceeing. For anything... For any negative bullshit, there's people who will be like, I fucking think you're, like, years ago, I think you're a piece of shit human being, you know? And that's usually because I probably punched one of their friends out or told one of their friends or somebody that I'm going to punch them out. Um, and, and I'm not trying to encourage and brag and say I'm some big tough guy. I just mean, that, that was my attitude and, and rubs people the wrong way. Um, but nobody would say I'm a whack rapper. And I took a lot of pride in that. That was the identity I built. You know, people who even think I'm a shitty guy or people who want to hit me will still save me. Ah, but he's a fucking dope rapper, man. Um, so this, the scariest part was, number one, what if everybody thinks it's stupid? What if everything I built, what if I lose everything? What if the new name, the new pursuit, the new image, the new brand doesn't work, but I also lose the respect and the identity and the legacy of what I've already accomplished. Um, so that was really difficult to deal with, as well as the insecurity 
of uh, geez, sorry, as well as the insecurity of the idea itself. Because when I came out as Ragnar Valen and, and I decided I was only going to do fight for the ninety percent, my my focus as a career was just going to be the fight music, just doing walkout songs for the best fighters and songs for media companies and gyms and and hopefully be on TV and. The fear was, you know, I woke up every day knowing that his words, I had respect, and I, I knew people felt what I did. You know, I'd, I'd earned that and I'd built my stripes. Yes. You know, I'd built my status. When I changed the name, what if everybody thinks the idea is stupid? What if, what if nobody wants me to do their walkout songs? What if everybody just says, what a loser trying to fucking grasp at straws? Because nobody's done this. Nobody has been a fight musician. It's like I do martial arts and I make music, so now I make music for people who do martial arts, walkout songs, whatever. It's never been done in history. So at the time, I didn't really understand the magnitude of it, but the idea of doing something that had never been done, what if everybody hates it? And what if I just end up looking fucking stupid? What if I ruin the identity I already had and then I end up with no identity? And I end up with nothing. I have no fans. I have no network. I have no support. Um, leaving yourself vulnerable to that was fucking just terrifying. Because um, I didn't know. I didn't. Just because a couple of my friends say, you know, guys I'd done some walkout songs before, said you're dope and they're great and you, you know, you're, you're going to do great at it. Still like, what if everybody just thinks the idea is stupid? I'm just some, some rapper who doesn't want to let go of his 90s sound. Yeah. And, and it, it was fucking scary, man. It was the, the, the lead up to dropping Toby Smith's walkout, which just happened on its own, like, was crazy because I didn't expect much from it at all. Like, I only did Toby's walkout because when I was in Thailand, when I was in Bangkok in 2014, I was chilling with Victor Nagby and came in picking and Chris Ferguson, and we saw Toby, and they knew him from FA Group. So we all just started talking and shooting the shit. Um, I, I ended up getting at Toby, and we talked about me doing his walkout song in 2014. And then we just lost touch. Um, he was dealing with some personal stuff, and, and I was dealing with some personal stuff. So when this all came about, it was about November, and... I was started working on something with Kevin Ross. Um, you know Kevin Ross? Yeah, man. I've had a chat with him. He's a cool dude. He's a very, very cool dude, man. Um, so it was actually Kevin Ross who got me back into things. Um, I don't know if you want. We can discuss it after. I'll let you know. I've never discussed it publicly yet, but I, I'll do that for you. But anyway, me and Kevin Ross were working on something, um, and I was like, fuck it. I'm like, I just felt, I felt that, that magic again, you know, because I was like doing this, this very different thing with this very famous person, this, this person, Kevin Ross is obviously a huge inspiration to me as a North American kickboxer, as a North American Muay Thai practitioner, um, who started fighting and training at like a ridiculously late age, um, he was a huge inspiration to me. So I was like, fuck it, all right, let's try doing something else fight-related. Maybe Toby still wants me to do his walkout song, but I had no, there was no concrete decisions, or I just thought, maybe, we'll see. And then maybe I'll have this thing going on with Kevin Ross, and I can do Toby Smith's walkout song, and, and hey, maybe I'll just do some fight shit for fun. And so I hit up Toby, and he was like, that sounds fucking dope, mate, aces, and, and you know, oath, and all that other Australian slang. Oath. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm used to it by now, but I mean, at the time, I was like, oh, yeah, sure, sure. is that good? Is that thumbs up, right, Toby? He's like, so, so I did it, and, and he loved it, and, and the guys at the pit loved it, and I had a little, a little video animated thing put together, but I literally had no expectation of it. Uh, it was just something I was doing for fun. I really had no idea what I was doing with it. I just wanted it to be heard. I hadn't put out music in so long or done anything in so long. Um, I just wanted to put something out. And uh, and it went crazy. Like, I didn't know, I didn't realize how how well-known Toby was and how many supporters and fans he has. And 
and I got hit up by so many people. They thought it was the coolest shit ever, and I'm getting all these messages from all these fucking strangers from the other side of the world, like, who aren't even rap fans, a lot of them. Like, they're not rap, or they don't listen to rap music as a whole. They just love Toby and my song uh, that went with it. And after that, it, it was crazy. I didn't, I'm watching it go from 500 views to 1,000, to 2,000, to 3,000, to 4,000, and, like, I didn't expect to get more than maybe 500 or 1,000 maybe. I had no, I hadn't released music in over a year. Yeah. I hadn't even actively done music in over a year. So I didn't know what to expect. And when the response was so epic and so like, holy fuck, so positive from so many people that are just regular people. In the underground rap world, you kind of develop a specific type of fan. It's a, a grassroots almost cult following. Yeah. Um, but then with this, these were all just these average Joes, 40-year-old women, you know, like with families and kids messaging me to tell me how cool the song is and all these comments and shares, all these hundreds of people sharing it. And it, it changed, man. It changed my whole perspective. I was like, this is a really cool thing. And it was because of that walkout song that I realized that there could actually be a future in this, that like maybe this is what I'm meant to do. And then it, it just kind of spiraled from there. Um, see, was, see, when you when you make a song um, for a specific fighter um, or purpose, can you explain the process? Like, example, would you do you have like a beat in mind, and then you put lyrics over the top of it, or do you write lyrics and then you look, and then you try and make the perfect beat to go with what you've written? I usually will. I mean, I have an archive of beats from all types of different beat makers around the world. Um, usually people send me aggressive stuff because that's my style. So I usually have a lot of that shit sitting around. Um, when I hit up a fighter or a fighter hits me up, first thing I want to do is I want to know what kind of sound they're looking for. Like, what do you want from it? You know, most of them just want really savage. Like, they want music that's like war fucking music, which is my specialty. So that's not a problem. So I send a couple beats. You know, <coughs> hey, let me know... Let me know what beat you like best, or do you like this beat? And then as soon as I get the nod, yeah, I like that, or I want this one, um, then I send them a questionnaire. You know, there's certain information I know, but I want specific, so I'll send them 20 questions of, of to, to pull information from them, their favorite fighters, their most challenging fight, their gym, where do they rep, where were they born, um, you know, any anything personal that is... It's custom to them to make that song about them and not me just saying a bunch of spinning elbow to the face and a kick to the liver and a fucking knee to the mouth or whatever, whatever. I want it to be custom to them. I want them to listen to it and I want it to be personal. So they send me a questionnaire. I send them a questionnaire. They answer the questions and then I just write it based off of that. So half of it will be based on the, the answers to their questions or things they've, they've illustrated to me that they would like included and then the rest of it I just kind of make up with you know cool punchlines and similes about different techniques and, and braggadocious things like in the Liam Harrison one uh, um, I've done so many of them I lose my I'm like uh, no because I was going to say like you I've, like when you listen to your songs you definitely do your homework on the fighters it's not just it's not only stuff that everyone would know it's stuff that it's like, oh, how did he? How did he know that? Yeah, that's. I, I I try and make it really personal, and it's to the fighters. It's it's like they're not used to it, so the reactions and the answers I get are usually very humble, which is so humbling to me. Because as a as a, a musician or an MC in the in the underground music world, you don't get that a lot. Um, hmm. So it's almost like I have to pull it out of them because I just find fighters don't like to talk about themselves a lot. They There's a couple of them. For the most part, they don't. They don't. They don't like to 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 um, boast and brag about their achievements and and how good they are. They're very humble. So I almost have to pull it out of them, and they'll give yeah. me these kind of small yeah. answers, and then I'm like, okay, but how did you feel when you did that? Like, how was that? When you did that, what happened? What was the next fight you got because of that? If you hadn't won this fight, do you think you and I just try and pull as much personality out of them 
as I can so I can put it in the song and and make it personal. I mean, I mean like Victor Nagby, um, more people heard that fucking walkout I did when he walked out to fight Bokau uh, a few weeks back and it ended up yeah. being on Fox Sports Asia and just the YouTube video alone of the fight has like a million and a half views and you hear my song first thing. More people heard that fucking song in 48 hours based off of the promotion that went behind that fight and the fact that Victor kept that in that, kept my song and everything and he's very proud of it because of how personal I made it to him. Um, more people heard that song than have probably, without knowing it, but heard that song more people heard that than have probably heard all of my music of my whole career. You know, if yeah. you put all the people who've heard my music over the years together, it probably won't equal how many people heard that one song for that one fight. And it was because of how personal I made it to Victor that he felt so connected to it. And he stands by it so hard. Him, Dennis Purick, Andy Housen, like, they love their shit. And, and the response I get from these guys of how much they love it is so humbling to me. As a rapper, you're you're begging people to give you praise for your shit because everyone's your competition. Most of the people you're trying to sell your your music to are other aspiring rappers. Um, so you don't get that really humble kind of appreciation. And when I do it for these fighters, man, they're like the nicest guys, like these ass-kicking assassin killers. And they're... You you would never think by talking to any of these guys for even a second that that they can do what they can do. And then you talk to a, a, a barely accomplished MC who still lives in his mom's basement and he'll act like he's God's gift to the fucking world. Um, so being able to do these songs, to be able to personalize them for these guys in a, in a manner, in a fashion that they connect with so sincerely and genuinely, and then their appreciation is so genuine it's actually like changed me as a person and, and the way I, I view the music I do um, the value that I bring to other people through my music um, I doubted myself for a long time and I just realized I was in the wrong world man um, I was in the fucking monkey the, the, the bucket of monkeys the barrel of monkeys trying to climb out with 10 million other people trying to do the same thing and and now I got my own little thing here um, and, and it's been more than just musically fulfilling. It's been very personally fulfilling. And from what I gather from the fighters, um, their appreciation is because of the effort I, I make to to really bring them out in the song and not just make some song about a bunch of smashing, you know. Yeah. So um, why why Ragnar Vallon? Uh, why, why the name change? Is there any significance behind the new name? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so... I am part of a uh, underground hip hop collective known as the Dead Rabbits. Um, it's been around. I'm, I've been a fan of them and, and a supporter of them for probably the better part of ten years. Um, I've been down with them for about four years now. Personally, um, they started out in New York, um, and of course, uh, they're from Long Island, Queens, different boroughs. So very warrior, savage, Viking fucking type of music um, all of them sound like me we all sound pretty much the same types of dudes and that name derived from gangs of New York the Dead Rabbits which was the main gang it was uh, um, Liam Neeson was the head and he ends up dying at the beginning and then Leonardo DiCaprio was his son and he takes over and he goes to war with the butcher uh, for the five points of, of New York and the ra that's where the violin came from so Valen came from the Gangs of New York element because um, Liam Neeson's character was Priest Valen and Leonardo DiCaprio was his son. So that's where Valen came from and Ragnar came from Ragnar Lothbrook from the show Vikings because I'm a fucking savage and I really wanted a name. There's a, a problem I had with words was words is just a fucking word. Uh, you type in words into a YouTube or anything and you're, you're going to get everything but me. Yeah. Um, so I wanted a name that still symbolized who I was, what I stand for. Uh, words and wordsmith are obviously they're self-explanatory as to why I chose those names to represent me previous. Um, and Ragnar Valen was a name that held incredible um, 
sincere sentiment and personal achievement or personal identification with. And it was also a name that people, I'm the only one. So when someone types in Ragnar Val and I come up, um, and, and that's where it, it derived from. Both Ragnar and Valen have, have uh, very specific symbolisms. Yeah, nice, brother, nice. Um, and this has been an incredible journey you've been on. Um, what can we expect to see from you in the near future? Brother, um, I, the walkout songs will continue. Um, I mean, hopefully. Hopefully people still keep wanting me to, to do it. Um, so I don't know where this is all going to take me. Um, I think with before, with words and with my, my previous pursuit and the, the way I went about that, I had a predetermined idea of, of where I was going and what I thought I was going to become and what I wanted to accomplish. Um, and nothing ever goes that way. Um, with this, I have no expectations. I really don't. I, 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 when I started this, I gave myself two years before I would have a name that was branded at all, and I was doing like high caliber fighters walkout songs consistently. I gave myself two years. It took three months, man. So everything happens so fast, I'm not even able to keep up with it. I, like I said, I, I wasn't even confident where this was going to go or, or how people were going to take to this when I first kind of started, started it about six months ago. So I don't know. Um, what I can tell people is, of course, I'm going to continue to try and make walkout songs for the best fighters. Um, I'd love to branch out into professional MMA as well, um, as there's a, a bit more of a, of a mainstream um, exposure through MMA. Um, so I'm going to continue that. The one thing that I haven't spoke about to anybody is uh, I'm working on an album about the life of Kevin Ross. Nice. A whole, a whole album. Um, it's very personal. It's not a rap album. It's not. It's just an album. Me and Kevin have been working on it f for about six months now. I'm about eight songs deep. Um, I'm up to the. I'm up to the point of his of him. He's about to fight his first fight, his first ever fight. Um, that's the song I'm at. Uh, I call it an audio biography. It's uh, like a musical, like a story. It's my same sound, same style. But it's just not a bunch of hippity hoppity rapidy stuff. So it's it's very personal. It's very cinematic. Um, and Kevin has been very very open with me with the information and, and the way that we are exchanging information and, and making this happen. So it's very very gritty, very real, um, and very emotional. And I'm taking my time with it. So I don't know when it will be done. I don't have like I said. I really didn't believe I'd even get to this point this quickly. So I'm just kind of taking it day by day. Um, I got to be honest, I, I probably wouldn't be at this point if it wasn't for Shanice from the Fight Ball. Um, when she heard the when, when I did the Toby song, and she hit me up to tell me how dope it was, um, and I started talking to her because she was just curious, like what, who the fuck are you, kind of thing, you know, <laughs> making these walkout songs. It was, she was intrigued, you know, as a journalist, she was intrigued at what I what I represented and. and who the fuck were you? Like, you just come out of nowhere, you're doing Toby Smith's walkout song with a video? Like, um, and I told her, I'm like, honestly, and I, I gave her a little quick lowdown, and she's like, you need to fucking message every fighter that you want to do a walkout song and send them a message. All of them. Every single one. And I was like, well, and she's like, what's the worst they can say? Fucking no? Yeah. She's like, just do it. <clears throat> so I did. I, me I messaged Liam Harrison and John Wayne Parr after I got off the phone. And they both said yes, so um, I wouldn't be doing... And then Andy Housen messaged me the next day um, because of Liam, so um, it, it just happened. And it, honestly, if, if Shanice hadn't said, pretty much get off your fucking ass and just go message them. Don't be a pussy. <laughs> um, I probably wouldn't have done what I'm doing, or, or at least been at this stage, because I was doubting myself at that point. I really was. I, I wasn't sure. Oh, this, this people liking this Toby song is just a fluke. Um, and it turned out to not be, but I, things happened a lot faster than I thought. Um, so I'm still trying to play catch up, but with, with wrapping my head around the whole thing, like, you know, six months ago, Liam Harrison was a guy who I just watched his Instagram videos 
and same with Andy Housen. Um, John Wayne Parr was just this guy I met one time and was the legend of, of um, you know, Western Muay Thai. Like, so it's really crazy for these guys who were just someone I watched on, I watched their fights and I watched their Instagram videos and their training videos for so many years. And then all of a sudden I'm doing their walkout songs and they're messaging me to tell me how awesome what I'm doing for them is. It's a lot to wrap your fucking head around, man. So um, I'm just thankful that for everybody who's given me the opportunity to do a walkout song, who's who's walked out to it, um, you know, who's shown me love and shown me appreciation for what I do and the effort I put into their music. It, it's really the most humbling thing. Like I'm, you know, if things were to end tomorrow, for whatever reason, I, I would be happy with what I did with it and the impact that I made on you know, on, on the fight world and the attempt I made doing something that never been done because this shit hasn't been done. I'm the first of my motherfucking kind. So everyone after me is a fucking copycat. Copycats <laughs> are welcome. I take it as flattery. And one day they're going to come. So, um, well, you've let the cat out. Well, like we, we can talk about it now. So you've, uh, I've heard it, but when are you going to be releasing officially the Liam Harrison walkout? Because I love that one. Um, I'm waiting for a gentleman from Oz to finish the highlight reel video we're putting out with it, but he oh, fights yeah. he fights in a couple weeks, so it has to be we need to have it done before his fight. He's fighting uh, O2 Arena in London on July 7th for uh, his title. So, and then I believe he's fighting for so I think he's fighting for number one in Britain. Uh, Muay Thai Grand Prix on the 7th and then he fights again shortly after that I believe and it's for a world title I think that's at a Yokao event um, yeah. so yeah I, I try and release the walkout songs in coordination with fighters fighting uh, John Wayne Parr just wanted me to release his earlier because he just wanted to before he walked out to it he wanted to know what people thought about it uh, it's, un, it's unfortunate that the same fucking day I released the song he ended up in the hospital with an infection in Thailand so <laughs> yeah, oh, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got a cracked heel, dry skin, cracked heel in Australia. Then came out here, and uh, and kept training with Jazzy because Jasmine has her had her fight, which she won. So that's um, congratulations, as Jazzy Parr. That was um, last night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw I saw some of the highlights. She's sharp, man. Oh my god, she's a fucking killer, bro. Um, but yeah, so training with her, it ended up just getting infected and went right up his leg. So he's he's been in the hospital for like four days now and. And uh, so, poor John Wayne Parr. Wish you the best, man. Hope you get better. Hope Speedy you get better, brother. Really well. Um, and just before I let you go, man, what I wanted to ask was, I know that um, obviously you are connecting and contacting people that you want to do fight um, walkout songs for, but if someone listening to this thinks, oh shit, I might want to fight walkout song for me, and they get in contact with you, do you do that or? Or are you busy at the oh. moment? Oh, oh yeah, man. I I encourage. There's, I mean, I'm just I'm busy. I got a lot of life stuff going on. But there are some guys I wanted to contact my own. Uh, Reese, I wanted to contact him. Um, fuck, what was the other guy's name? Um, the guy Toby fought last. Sam. Sam Goff. Yeah, yeah. Just guys like that, man. That I, I, you know, I've done the walkout songs for the guys that I was like. I wanted to do them for my own personal enjoyment, like for my own, my own personal fulfillment and satisfaction. But anybody who's who wants one, please feel free to contact me. I love doing this. I, I, I love, like I said, I, I love hearing and experiencing the reaction that these guys get when I take their, their personal feelings, their personal accomplishments, their ups, their downs, and throw it into a song for them. I love that. So holler at me. We can work out a deal. You know, I'm... I'm not some rich rapper guy charging lots of money for things, man. I, 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 I do mine a lot for the love of the way you do yours for the love of the way you do. And if something happens, something happens. Uh, you can reach me Instagram at Ragnar Valen, R-A-G-N-A-R-V-A-L-L-O-N. Gmail the same, Facebook the same, um, or Andrew Martin on Facebook. You can, If you want to get at me a little more personally, you can find me through Mudsy, uh, the Muay Thai interviews page. But... Yeah, um, I'm open for whoever. I encourage it, and I would, I'd love to make songs for as many people as possible. Companies, gyms, promotional companies, apparel companies, 
Muay Thai interviews companies, anybody who needs, um, who wants something. It's not about walkout songs. It's a, it's about making custom music. It's about making custom music for the listener or for the subject rather than making music for myself and hoping other people like it. I'm trying to make music for the people. I, I love the reaction I get. Andy Housen had the best one. He sent me the craziest message about how much he loved it. Um, and he messaged me to ask me to do it for him. And then when I did do it, he fucking lost his mind. <laughs> he, could, he couldn't believe it. Um, so uh, I get an, an immense joy out of that. Um, I love doing this for people. So I, I hope nobody feels... Um, you know, sideways about approaching me. Please don't message me, holler me, email me, whatever. We'll make it work, man. Excellent, as long as you're not man. a ballet dancer. No ballet dancers allowed. <laughs> Excellent, my man. And last but certainly not least, um, is there anyone you wish to thank or give a shout out to? <sighs> yeah, there's a few. Uh, number one, shout out to you, Mudsy. Thank you very much for uh, taking me in, bringing me onto the show. Um, Jeez, well, you know. Being a rapper from Canada, you know, I, I appreciate you, you you seeing the the intrigue uh, in what I do. Um, to my crew, all my Dead Rabbits crew, um, they believed in me even when I was down um, and knew I, you know, always pushed me to, to continue making my type of music and not giving up. Um, my daughter, my daughters Emma and Lily, there's just so many people to thank, I, I guess... I'm sure a lot of them will hear this one, but I really got to thank all the fighters. I got to thank the Fight Vault, Shanice and, and the girls at the Fight Vault, um, Toby Smith, Sam Valentine, um, Skinny Bones, the godfather who does all my graphics, and all the fighters. And if I missed anybody, please, and you hear this, I, I, this is on the spot. I don't have a list in front of me. I'm just throwing off some fucking names. Um, <laughs> but all, all the fighters, all the fighters who... who who trusted me to make something personal for them. Uh, it means a lot, especially Kevin Ross, um, the the information and, and how personal we've gotten to start making this album is, is very humbling to me. Um, so big ups to him, Soul Assassin, and to all, all the fighters, Liam Harrison, uh, Victor Nagby, Andy Housen, John Wayne Parr, uh, Arthur Sorcer, Robert Thomas, Dennis Purick, um, you know, the bad coach Jim for even saying, yeah, you know, can do a theme for me or for us. It's it's a really humbling experience, and I thank everybody for even just taking five seconds to listen. Um, I, I appreciate it infinitely. And once again, if you want a walkout song or a custom song or anything, holler at me, holler at Mudsy, um, and feel free anytime to ask. Excellent, mate. Well, thank you very much for your time, and uh, I think what you're doing is bloody awesome, mate, so keep up the good work. Thank you, man. Um, I hope I, I hope I, I gave ample information and uh, didn't squawk everyone's ear off too much. But uh, I, I really appreciate it. Australia has been showing me a lot of love. I, I have a, a lot of love for Australia. I'm I'm trying my fucking hardest to get out there as soon as I can, man. Um, uh, I'm coming. I got to get out there. It has awesome, to, brother. Thanks for your time, dude. Thank you very much for having me, man. You have a great one, and uh, I'll talk to you again soon. Cheers, brother. Peace out, everyone.